Hmm. It's not working. It's we can I I can see it. I can see it. <clears throat> what do you Ray? What do you have on your screen? What are you seeing? You need to you know, unmute yourself real quick. Just tell me what you're seeing at on your screen. Because <clears throat> you may have to minimize the, uh, if you're having, if you have everybody's picture on there, you may have to minimize that to be able to see her slides. Okay, if not, I mean, I can also attach frozen, it to frozen. Yeah. yeah, okay. He's frozen. He, okay. Um, I'll, I'll attach the I'll attach the PDF so he can have a copy of it. Yeah, if you um, you can throw it in the chat box. They you, they can pull a link off of that if you can just throw a link in the chat box. Okay, I'll do that. So um, I just want to give you a little bit of introduction on on Mortgage Pros. Um, this this again, it's it's more so to cover the products that we offer. Um, Al Salinas is our branch manager, and I am a loan officer originator with uh, Mortgage Pros. Um, a little bit about us, uh, Mortgage Pros is a mortgage provider supported by Directions Equity LLC. And we are based, our main office is based in McAllen, but we also have that this branch in Mission, Texas. And um, that way there's accessibility for your customers if they need to see loan officers in McAllen or loan officers in Mission we can make uh, arrangements for them to attend either location. Uh, we do provide residential financing for these type of loans, which are purchases, investment loans, and we also specialize in refinancing um, loans for customers. So our products, um, if you, some of us, have worked together in the past the majority of uh, mortgage companies we offer the same type of uh, products what makes us different is um, of course the way we deliver the information to your client and um, anything has to do with pricing uh, some companies um, customers shop us because of that reason because they're looking for better pricing or um, other items that they might offer versus we uh, versus what we offer but the type of loans that we do conduct here are conventional loans and i'll explain i'm going to go in into a little bit of depth of each how they work what the uh, requirements are we also offer fha loans we do work with usda loans va loans uh, i'm going to touch a little bit about one-time construction loans as well that we have and one of them that we will kind of um, go in depth would be the down payment assistance program um, so that you can understand what we have to offer to your clients. So on the conventional loans, um, who qualifies for these types of loans? I make kind of a notation on the side um, that realtors really can keep this in mind so that you can know if you're trying to do a contract for your buyer, is this customer gonna qualify for conventional or are they gonna necessarily have to go some other way. So who can qualify for these type of loans? Um, on a conventional loan, they don't have to be a first time home buyer um, or they don't even have to be owner occupied. They can do a conventional loan as an investment purchase. Um, of course, investment purchases will require about 25% down to try to finance an investment property. And you can give me um, an idea what an investment property would be. What do you think would be would fall under investment property investment loans? Would it be like a duplex? Yes. So anything, yeah, exactly anything over a one or two units, three units, four units, even uh, properties where customers want to buy a, a home for rental purposes would be considered an investment. But the key behind that is is really the down payment requirement um, that we will request. Okay. I want to just pitch yes. in a little bit on this one. Yes. Uh, um, investment property is uh, not necessarily property that is income producing, if not necessarily because it's a two or three or four unit makes it an investment property. Uh, we 
try to stay away from the investment term. We, tr we, we work with owner occupied, second home and non-owner occupied. That's really the change in terms. And the reason I say that is because um, we, you know, one, a very common scenario is someone buying a property for the first time. So, you know, they, they, they like to buy an income producing property such as a fourplex as an owner occupied property. So a first time buyer can buy a fourplex as a primary residence, occupy one of the units, and he's got three units making money to them. And it's not necessarily an investment property. Um, it's still an owner occupied primary residence. So that is really what makes the difference for financing purposes. Um, so just to, you know, throw that in there. Um, the, don't, don't, don't make that mistake of thinking he wants a fourplex. He's going to need 20, 25% down payment. That's not necessarily the case. It's the occupancy of the property and what's, what's available or eligible for the borrower to be, to be occupied as. So keep that in mind. Yeah, that is, that is correct, Oz. Um, so, and, and, and we'll go case by case on a, on a customer would we'll definitely review it that way with the occupancy to make sure how are we gonna set up the file or the loan that best benefits a customer at that point. Um, so the, on these type of deals, conventional loans or minimum FICO score, it is a 620 or higher. Uh, down, down payment requests start from between three to 5% down. It just depends on the, uh, on the buyer situation. Um, and the limits can go up to $510,000 uh, in the Hidalgo County. Uh, anything above that amount would be considered a jumbo loan and the requirements change a little bit for those type of deals. Um, so what is a conventional loan? Well, basically they're backed up by the government agency but they do follow some government guidelines. Most conventional loans conform to loan limits set by the, by the Federal Housing Finance Agency and follow the credit score and down payment guidelines set by the government sponsored en enterprises known as Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. Uh, because conventional loans aren't insured by guaranteed or government, their eligibility requirements for borrowers are usually stricter than the requirements of FHA, VA, or USDA mortgages. Um, when it comes to the property itself, the opposite is true. Government mortgages programs tend to have a stricter appraisal requirements uh, than conventional loans. So if you have a, a property that um, is in distress or has a lot of cosmetic issues, um, you know, uh, we tend to put those properties on a conventional loan versus an FHA because they'll have a little bit more requirements. Any questions on the conventional? products that we offer? Uh, yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Are conventional loans easier to get than, uh, say, for example, FHA? Um, it will depend on the buyer and their credit. So uh, conventional loans are a little bit, um, they look for a more stronger buyer. So somebody with a higher FICO score, somebody with a little bit more uh, assets to work with will probably be your conventional buyer and your fha is is more uh, groomed for a buyer that has less funds to work with and has some kind of credit issues so uh, we we will look at as a whole and do recommendations based on what we see if they if they're best suited for an fha loan or for a conventional loan okay thank you uh going back to the uh, investment homes and investment properties if I was interested in buying a home uh, to, uh, to flip, would that be uh, considered an investment home? Yeah, um, most definitely. Do you, the, we're going to ask some questions. You already own a primary resident, okay? And how do you intend, to, like Asset said, the occupancy is, an, is a, one of the most important things that we will look at. How do you intend to occupy that property? If you're not, if you're going to be non-owner occupied, then yes, we would have to figure out if this is gonna be an investment setup. Um, and then that's how we determine the down payment requirement based on that. Um, us, uh, and if I, if I could real quick, just so you know, uh -huh. uh, Ray, Ray is an investor also. Yes. That's, that's why he's asking those questions. Oh, okay. Yeah, so if, if, yeah to elaborate on that, if, uh, if your intention is to flip the property, then most definitely that's going to be a non-owner occupied uh, purchase transaction, which will require on, on single family residence down payment varies based on the type of property. 
single family residence requires 15% down payment if the borrower has eligibility for mortgage insurance. Uh, otherwise, if FICOs are a little bit too low under six, uh, 660, then you may need to put 20% down. But um, uh, that's on single families, uh, two, three, four units is uh, 20 and 25% depending on the, on the number of units. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you for the question, Ray. <clears throat> Okay, so the next uh, product that we offer is FHA loans, and this might answer some questions that Ray has. Um, FHA loans, again, they, they um, who qualifies for these type of loans and what are the limits on these loans that we do offer? So right now, um, Mortgage Pros is working with a minimum FICO score of 600 or higher. The original guideline had it at 580, but because of all the um, things that are happening with the economy, they went there, the, our company uh, is working with a 600 or higher FICO score. There will be companies um, that might still be accepting the 580 FICO score. With, with a lot of overlays, that's uh, something that you would need to ask or the customer needs to ask uh, what those overlays would be. Um, <clears throat> in in uh, the difference between this one and, and the uh, conventional side, if somebody does decide to go FHA, it must be owner occupied. They do have to live in the residence and claim it as a primary residence. Okay, so if somebody comes in and says, "I want to buy a second home or, you know, downsize," that's a question we ask: Is this going to be your primary home? Because it's a requirement by FHA. Okay, um, the limits in Hidalgo County to borrow under FHA uh, go up to three hundred and fourteen thousand. Um, again, depending on the if it's a single family unit or one or two units, we those amount or limits increase, but we're and specifically for a uh, home purchase, single family unit would be three hundred fourteen thousand dollars. So if you're selling a house for three twenty five, we might not be able to do it under FHA because of the limits. Okay. So the important uh, FHA guidelines for borrowers: FHA is a Federal Housing Administration provides mortgage insurance on loans made by FHA approved lenders. Uh, FHA insures these loans on single family, and we also do multifamily home financing. And I, um, Oz had mentioned, you know, if somebody wants to buy a fourplex and they're gonna intend to occupy one of the units, yeah, they definitely can go FHA as long as they occupy one of the four units. Okay. Um, it is the largest insurer of residential mortgages in the world, insuring uh, tens of millions of properties since 1934. Um, again, I did mention that in our company, our FICO score for these type of deals have to be over 600. We do require um, mandatory down payment of 3.5%. This down payment can be gifted by a family member if the customer is limited on funds. Um, any FICO scores between five to 580 um, require 10% down payment. I just put that in there. Um, I'm not sure, Oz, is there, is, are we still taking the 10% the down? Uh, this is on, on what? FHA? FHA? On five, 500, not right now. Yeah. We're, we're on pause, anything under five, uh, under 600 FICO scores. Can, can you explain to the group why, I mean, well, why are we are holding back on those type of uh, buyers? Yeah, Where certainly. Um, you know, FHA uh, is, is uh, the more flexible of top of agencies for lending purposes. Um, so it is backed and guaranteed by, by a federal agency. So due to the turmoil that's going on in the economy right now, they're taking a very conservative approach. And it's not necessarily the HUD agency or, or, or um, uh, the federal agency is more investors in themselves. Just the fact that uh, the default ratio on, on credit scores under 600 goes about 30% higher than any other type of credit scoring. So it's an immediate red flag to be lending in this type of environment with a much higher default ratio. Because not only are you taking on a higher risk, but also on the situation that unemployment um, uh, terms right now are extremely high and and you know they're kind of coming back down to to you know, maybe not normal but they're not escalating anymore 
but at the end of the day, um, you know, just the, the fact that so many people are losing their jobs or have a pause on their income has made all these investors to, to say, you know, wait a second, we're going to pause all the lending for FICO scores under 600 or 580, or in this case, 500 FICO scores. Um, the good news is that HUD has not taken a different position, not taken a different position. They have not come out and stated, well, we're not lending to these borrowers. It's just investors particular that they just don't want to take on that unnecessary risk during this, these, these times. Awesome, thank you, thank you so much. Any questions about that? If I could, not necessarily about that, if I could just jump in for a second. Okay. That, that part that Oz mentioned, you're only the second lender I've ever heard mention that, and uh, that's an awesome uh, thing. The first one was actually Mr. Cuellar, years and years ago, uh, as I, I was monitoring a GRI class and he was one of the speakers there. That fourplex, that's what I'm talking about, that fourplex idea, and I've shared that with first-time home buyers over and over and over. We actually have one here in Harlingen. and the guy was a first-time home buyer, was able to pick up a fourplex foreclosure with FHA, mm -hmm. and um, it lives in it. He's added carports to it, he's added storage lockers to it, and um, he, li he bought it and lives in one of the apartments. It's worked out great for him investment-wise. It's a great yeah. way for first-time home buyers if they'll do that. I'll leave you alone. Yeah, and, and just to get a better idea when when one when a loan is structured that way for a first time buyer coming in with three and a half percent down payment on a fourplex, call it it'd be two hundred two hundred and fifty all the way to three hundred and fifty thousand. Um, as long as they can get their mind past the fact that they're borrowing so much on their first property. Um, and the lender does a good job at explaining the, the benefits of cash flow and understanding that really what they're doing is investing minimal on a income producing property that it what eventually will turn into a true investment property. Um, they're going to be living rent free. So the three units, because FHA requires a self sufficiency test, meaning that the three units that are generating income must cover the mortgage payment of their, that borrower in order for the property to be eligible for FHA financing. So that borrower will for sure live rent free as long as the three units are occupied. So my suggestion always when I'm, I'm, I'm lending or structuring a loan for a first-time buyer, it doesn't necessarily have to be a first-time buyer for somebody buying a home uh, or, or a primary residence in, on FHA terms, uh, I, I always tell them, I was like, look, you know, the only difference in this scenario is that you want to continue making rent payment. You don't want to just not pay anything. What you want to do is your rent payment, you want to pay it to you. You want to make it to the principal of your note. So this becomes a true investment and cash flowing property for you in the years to come. So when people capture that and they're able to grasp the the information on how to pay down this property and paying principal their rent to principal i mean they'll be done in a at, at any, anywhere between 12 to 15 years if they do that from year number one and obviously most people eventually will you know move out of the property and lease that fourth unit which is perfectly fine they just need to sign an intent to occupy so their intention has to be truly to move in and any circumstance changes, nothing holds them back to live in the property those 12 months. You know, whatever the case may be, they can leave the property. I've done loans for a fourplex uh, first time buyer. They live in the property three months, they get married. We do financing for, for a single family residence within six months, and that is perfectly fine. And we can, um, we can always do it as a primary residence, not FHA, but, but primary residence. But but anyhow, just just to kind of reiterate on what 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 Mac was saying, this is a really powerful tool if you're able to explain it properly to someone buying a home with FHA financing for for some, and especially someone single or someone that doesn't need a whole lot of space. This is an excellent opportunity. So if it's if it's you know uh, provide if the information is provided clearly to the buyer, I'm telling you this is this is a win win. Quick question. Yes. How do we find out the limits in other counties for FHA? Just, I mean, you can, as easy as Googling, um, you'll, it'll be the first thing that will pop up. But four units, I think they're right now at about uh, 500 and change. 
So yeah. all the, you know, camera and well see Hidalgo, um, Nuestras County, all that, it's, it's going to be high for four plexus. Uh, and it's different. Um, the, the, the limit that Eva has there, that's the limit for single family residents. Yeah. And that is, that is the loan amount. So that's not the sales price. So as long as a borrower can put, you know, I think the, the, the sales price, I think if I'm not mistaken, is 321,000. So three and a half percent down of that brings the borrower down to 314. Or if the borrower says, well, I want to put five, 10%, then it's 314, the loan amount, whatever, you know, the sales price may be on top, then they need to come in, come in with the, with the cash, with the down payment to reduce that to 314,827. And like I said, it, it varies on, on, um, type of property. So number of units. And I have a question just to have it clear. Uh, for how long do you have to live on an FHA loan? Let's say a full flex. Mm -hmm. So there's, there's not necessarily anything that says you have to live in this property for this amount of time. The borrower only signs what it's called an intent to occupy. So the intent to occupy is their intention that they're going to live in this property for a minimum of 12 months. So if there's no changing circumstances, then they, 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 they just need a sign that they have an intention to move into this property. Um, and, and I mean, there's really nothing that they have to be, you know, providing of as far as writing or the investor is going to be checking it that they moved in. None of that. It's just really a, uh, a, 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 I guess a disclosure in good faith that they're going to occupy it as, 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 as owner occupied. I understand. And now I have uh, some customers that they were asking me if they're interested on purchasing a house and also some fourplex as an investment. And they were saying, we want to get out of the doubt of what should we get first, either the house or the fourplex? The fourplex all day long. And, and now <laughs> the, you got you to gotta be careful with that. So when I, I always recommend buying the fourplex first, because once you buy a... Um, a single family residence, you can't obtain a fourplex in, in with terms of owner occupied. So if they truly want to make this an investment and they want to cash flow largely and make this a, you know, in other words, they're looking at their return of investment and they're asking you for caps and all that, then, then they don't want to go FHA because their cash flow is going to be minimal. They're going to have a high mortgage insurance. Uh, their, their down payment is only three and a half percent down unless they want to, you know, put more down. But, a, a better product for fine for for investment purposes is conventional. Um, however, if they want to obtain the property and be 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 conscious that with three and a half percent their cash flow is only going to be you know seven eight hundred dollars a month and they're okay with that, you know the investment is very minimal fifteen thousand less than that uh, compared to eighty ninety thousand dollars on a conventional loan. So my, to answer your question specifically, um, it's always best to acquire a fourplex if you know they 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 eventually want to buy a house because they can still buy the house as a, as a as a as an owner occupied conventional with five percent down payment. If they buy that fourplex, or uh, if they buy I'm sorry if they buy the house first, then the fourplex can only be obtained as an investment property at that point because because there's no argument that we can buy as a lender that says. Well, you already own a home, but I'm, I'm going to finance you a fourplex and create an argument that you're going to live on an 800 you know, square foot apartment when you were living on a, I don't know, 1500 square foot home. Um, so it's always, if, if, if they have to make that choice, always fourplex first, then single family. Thank you. Mm -hmm. If I could jump in and ask a question also, please. The, mm -hmm. um, I mean, you mentioned gifted funds. What are, what are they doing with that now? I honestly don't know. I know I know that at one point they had to hold them for 30 days or something like that a few years ago. But recently in one of the classes in San Antonio, somebody said that they were told they had to hold on to it for 60 days. They had to be in the buyer's account. What are you guys seeing? You want to answer that or you want me to answer it? Uh, go ahead, Oz. It's fine. So, so gift funds are treated differently on conventional and FHA, and not necessarily that um, you need to hold them for a, for a specific, specific period of time. If the gift is a legitimate gift coming from a family member, there's a, a list of uh, eligible people that can give to the buyer. 
um, there, there's no seasoning requirement. They could come in the day of closing, the day prior to closing. They could be transferred directly to the title company for closing. Uh, there's just a documenting process. We need to, you know, just source that it's a legitimate gift. So whoever is, is donating that money to the buyer, we have to obtain a bank statement from the person uh, donating that money to make sure that it didn't go in as cash the day before and then transferred over. Um, but, but it doesn't have a seasoning requirement. What they may have referred to is the seasoning of assets, which is different. Um, a lot of people have cash on hand or they have money that they can source the, you know, I don't know, especially in our market, we, we tend to run into this scenario quite often where, you know, the buyer just cashes their checks and just, you know, has mattress money. Well, that's, that's money we can't trace, we can't source. So we, our suggestion is always, if, if we're going FHA, so FHA requires one month of bank statement. So we always try to put that money in before the cycle of the statement in which we're going to be utilizing for approval begins. Um, conventional requires two months. So, well, it's, you know, depending on the scenario, uh, Freddie Mac requires one bank statement, uh, Fannie Mae requires two bank statements. So we usually try to keep it safe and say, okay, before the 60 day period of the transaction, uh, you want to have those funds in your bank account. But gift funds, they can come in at any given point during the, the, during the transaction. There's no season of requirement on the borrower side. So you are sourcing then um, where that money came from, like for the parents, because there was a transaction we had. Uh, there's a transaction we had where the parents had to prove they had the money that they gave the kids. Well, yeah. that, that that's a great area. Um, yeah. And it's up to the underwriter's discretion and the lender's discretion, in other words. So when we see that it's just evident that there that money, it's untraceable. So a lot of lenders or, you know, people tend to use this loophole and say the borrower has 10,000 cash in the bank, but we'll just treat it as a gift. They go give the 10 grand to the parents, parents deposit it, you know, on a Monday, and then they transfer on a Tuesday to the son back to his account. That, that's that's going to be very hard to argue. And then, like I said, it's a gray area because it could be a legitimate circumstance in which the parents, they just elected to have cash on hand and they deposited it into their own account. So we really, as a lender, you know, it's very difficult for us to say that we cannot accept that fund because we're now invading the privacy of a third party that has nothing to do with our transaction. So, you know, again, it's, it's just a very great area. Uh, but, you know, we try to look for just reasonable uh, transfers of gift. You know, we try to avoid those situations where it's just cash in, transfer out. Uh, we, you know, if that's the case, we always tell our borrowers, look, just, just let that money sit as long as possible. You know, you could have deposited on the beginning of the month and the transaction closed at the end. We'll wait the 20, 25 days and then ask the parents to transfer that money and wait. And, and FHA requires us to document the source. So we have to get a bank statement from the donor. Conventional doesn't. Conventional just requires us to show proof of the originating source, meaning that we just need uh, a transfer receipt or something stating the name of the borrower and the account number where they came from and proof that it's been deposited into either the title company or the borrower's account. So with convention, it's a little easier to get away and make, you know, avoid being so invasive or intrusive with the, with the third party, uh, you know, of, of, of whoever is donating. Thanks. Appreciate it. Yep. Okay. So I'm continuing on the FHA side. Um, one of the important things that we kind of um, want to mention is FHA loans do have mortgage insurance premium requirement. And that mortgage insurance premium is added on on top of your principal and interest, your homeowner's insurance payment, and your taxes. So that is also something that we discuss with the buyer to um, let them know that the mortgage insurance premium is a requirement and is added on to their loan payment. Um, and uh, one of the key things that makes this a uh, little bit different from a conventional loan is that this mortgage insurance premium will stay there for the life of the loan. If a buyer buys under conventional financing, 
uh, that mortgage insurance premium will drop after they pay 20% of equity on a conventional deal. Um, another cool thing about FHA is the debt to income ratio. They allow us to finance people at a higher uh, DTI. We can um, normally go stretch it out of, to 50%. In some cases, it can exceed that amount. We, we just have to go and review the customer individually to see who, who gets an approval on a higher DTI. On a conventional, uh, the DTI will be at uh, no greater than 45% um, if we can. We can stretch it up to 50% as well, but it's on case-to-case -case basis. Um, and the important part of the FHA loan, again, just to reiterate that information, uh, it must be a borrower's primary residence owner occupied. And that's the key when we're gonna try to do FHA financing. Um, right now, borrowers must have steady income and proof of employment. So with all the, the discrepancies of the um, people being laid off, um, we have to be double checking that the person is back to work. Having current pay stubs is something that we will require. Um, there is a two year employment history that they have to provide. Um, and we also have to figure out if they have any gaps, we would need to know the timing of those gaps as well uh, for employment. And we can definitely visit any uh, scenarios that you have so to, we can um, let you know if, if we're gonna have issues with the employment. Any questions on the FHA? I, I kind of summarized um, credit scores have to be over 580. That, that's a guideline, but our company has a 600 minimum FICO score. The down payment is a 3.5% down. Um, we do do ratios above 43%, and um, mortgage insurance is gonna be added on to the payment as well. Any questions? I think. Eva, I have yes. a question. More yes. or less, what is the percentage of the insurance of the, uh, of the premium, the MIP? Like just to get an estimate, if you're talking to somebody and they say, and I say, well, yeah, you have an MIP insurance that's going to be on top of your payment, and they're going to probably say, like, well, how much is it? Is there a, is there a calculation or something? You know, that's a great question. We actually have an application um, and a calculation mode that we can plug in the amount, and it gives you an estimated MI uh, average. To be honest with you, that MI will be based on their FICO score. So when we when we actually review the file for pre-qualification purposes, we run it through MI and it will give us an amount of give or take what their payment would be. But on average, I always kind of mention it'd be between 60 all the way to $125. It could be higher depending on the FICO score of the buyer. So I don't know, Oz, how do you, um, what do you recommend for them to give as an amount? As a we're, talking, we're talking more for the MI. For the MI, yeah, on FHA. Laura, your question is to mortgage insurance on conventional? Both, if you can provide okay. for that. So, so yeah, I just wanted to make sure that I clarified that because it's different for both scenarios. So FHA mm -hmm. is black and white, uh, you know, not necessarily 100%, but most of the time. Most people buying FHA or financing FHA is because they're doing minimum down payment, 3.5% down payment. So your mortgage insurance, FHA has an upfront mortgage insurance premium that is going to be 1.75% of the sales price of the home. So FHA has actually, and, and you know, forgive me if I get too technical, but I want to at least give you the information that we can simplify it later on. Uh, you know, so FHA has two mortgage insurance costs. One is upfront and it's 1.75 of the transaction, of the sales price of the transaction. Um, and that's a one-time fee. And it's added on to the financing of the loan. So the borrower doesn't have to come up with it out of pocket. But it's really important that the borrower is, you know, and this is an explanation we go through every single time we disclose an FHA loan. Um, so there's always confusion because the borrower will have two loan amounts. We'll have the base loan amount, which is your sales price minus your 3.5%. And then it will be adding the 1.75% mortgage insurance premium. So that will be your total loan amount. So that some, you know, a lot of times creates confusion in the borrower if we don't do that explanation very thoroughly and initially. So anyhow, so that's the upfront mortgage insurance premium for FHA. Also, FHA will have a monthly mortgage insurance premium, which Eva mentioned that is going to be 
for the for the life of the loan. In most cases, not every case, if a borrower is financing, you know, less than less than 95% loan to value, putting more than 5%, then it could be eliminated eventually after 11 years. But majority of the time, like I said, it's usually a 30 year fix, three and a half percent down payment. So that's the example I want to give you. The mortgage insurance on a monthly basis is 0.85% of the loan amount. So the way that FHA sees this is we can provide more flexibility for financing because we're far better insured than any other agency when it comes to mortgage lending. And then, um, so it's, but it's important that we always make this explanation to the borrower because, you know, we get this call all the time asking for the best interest rate. Uh, and we can talk about that later, but um, there's a blended rate with FHA, meaning that if I'm offering a 3% interest rate, that's not really their true interest rate because the mortgage insurance is going to be term wise. So it's 0.85% on top of your interest rate. So it's really a total of 3.85% uh, of, of, of interest. However, so to answer your question specifically, upfront mortgage insurance premium 1.75%, monthly 0.85% on FHA. Conventional, it's a total different animal. And my suggestion is don't even get into calculations mm -hmm. because not even we know that until we have a FICO, we have a loan to value or down payment, and we have debt ratios. With conventional, there's third party mortgage insurance companies that we have to quote the mortgage insurance through once we have a completed application. And, you know, it, it could vary depending somebody with, it could be two identical scenarios, but my debt ratio on one is 47% and the other one is 40%. This one with a higher ratio is going to have a higher mortgage insurance than the one with the lower FICO score. So, and, and again, you know, we, you, you could give an estimate of saying it could be anywhere be, between 0.5% to all the way to 1.25%. Um, I suggest given percent, percent versus dollar amount because it's based on your loan amount. You know, somebody buying 300,000, their mortgage insurance is going to be substantially higher than somebody buying 100,000. But like I said, that is that gets too technical, especially, you know, if a buyer is asking you, well, what's my payment like conventional? Uh, are you including mortgage insurance though that that buyer is better off speaking to us because we have to ask specifically they want a, a, a an accurate monthly payment with an accurate mortgage insurance the first thing is get, we're going to to require a credit inquiry so we know our credit score we can verify the income so and, and at that point we'll do a, an analysis of mortgage insurance and obtain a mortgage insurance quote um, the benefit of conventional is they don't, conventional doesn't have an upfront mortgage insurance premium. So there's, uh, that's a 1.75% benefit on conventional versus FHA. Um, and then conventional, I think Eva mentioned that as well, uh, they can eventually remove mortgage insurance once they accumulate a 22% uh, equity on the property. So the difference is conventional does allow you to remove it through the term of the loan as long as you reach that 22% or if you put 20% upfront, then you, you're, you don't have to pay that mortgage insurance at any given point for conventional. And there's also options where we can buy the uh, mortgage insurance premium. So it's, it's, uh, it's another calculation where we say, you know what, we'll charge you X amount of dollars to remove your mortgage insurance. Uh, but sometimes that's not very cost effective. Uh, it's only on certain scenarios. But anyhow, that's 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 more or less how it works. And and like I said, forgive me if I get too technical, but there's no way around it. it it's a, it's very technical when it comes to mortgage insurance. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, Oz. Any any other questions? So we're gonna move we're gonna move forward to the USDA loans. This is something that that um, a lot of customers call about and and. Uh, agents also question about the USDA loans. Um, these are um, loans that are offered to properties outside of city limits. And some of you know, um, when you do want a buyer to get 100% financing, the one of the things that we do first is try to map that property to see if it does belong in a USDA area. Uh, because even though the customer might qualify, we wanna make sure that the property is also located 
within the uh, guidelines of the program. Um, so uh, in this particular type of file, we do require 620 or higher FICO score. It is 100% financing, but it has its, its uh, requirements before we um, start telling customers that this product is out there available for them. Um, property must be located in a rural approved area. Uh, one of the key things about USDA loans too, that they allow 6% seller concessions. Um, a little bit about this program, it's the Section of 502 Guarantee Loan Program. Uh, it assists uh, approved lenders in providing low and moderate income host, uh, household the opportunity to own adequate, modest, and decent safe uh, sanitary dwellings as primary residents in eligible rural areas. Um, eligible applicants may purchase, build, or rehab um, improved or relocate dwellings in eligible areas up to 100% financing. Um, the program provides 9% of loan note guaranteed to approved lenders in order to reduce the risk of extending the 100% loan eligibility. So um, that, that's why people are coming in with no down payment. Um, but again, we do have to go into um, their website. And first of all, we do an income eligibility on the buyer. And uh, according to their guidelines, they cannot exceed over 150% of the median household income. Uh, the, the person has to agree that they're gonna occupy the dwelling as a primary residence. They must be a US citizen, um, resident alien or qualified alien. Um, and again, we do go into the eligible rural area. We have to utilize their website to look at the specific address to determine or to check to see if the property they wanna buy is in a USDA um, area, okay? So before we, uh, I've had a call a couple of days ago and the customer wanted 100% financing. Um, this is an option, but uh, I do reiterate that they, we have to make sure the property is also located in a USDA area. Any questions for USDA? Uh, yes, uh, is there like a, a map that would show uh, what qualifies for USDA? Yeah, you can go into the web portal and I have it on the link as well. I have the icon in there so you can click on it. But if you go to USDA uh, property search, um, it'll give you a box for the address and you type in the property address that you're looking at and it'll tell you if it is within the, the area mapped for USDA. Okay. But I would definitely do that first step is check to see that even that house is qualified for USDA before even telling them. Thank you. Okay, so the next, the next loans that we do have, we also offer VA loans. FICO score requirements for VA loans is a 620 or higher. Uh, one of the important things in a VA loan, they must be a veteran or provide a certificate of eligibility um, this, this tells us if they have entitlement to be able to buy under the U.S. the VA um, product. It is 100% financing as well. It also has to be owner occupied and the allowed sellable seller concessions is up to 4% as well for these type of loans. So uh, the basic part of it is uh, to obtain a VA loan, the applicant must be eligible veteran who has uh, available entitlement. I've had the question if they've already had a VA loan, can they acquire another VA loan? They can if they have enough entitlement to be able to borrow for an additional property. However, they have to occupy this current, this new purchase. So you can have a, a house in another state, but if they're gonna come and live in Texas, they have to occupy that property under their VA uh, guidelines. Uh, so again, veteran must occupy and intend to occupy the property as a home within a reasonable period after closing the loan. Uh, we do check the veteran's uh, satisfactory credit risk, um, you know, make sure that they can uh, afford the property or the, or the loan as well. Um, we do check the veteran's and spouse's income. Um, we need to make sure we, we go through the same uh, review as we do any other loan, making sure that they have the income stability. Um, if they have additional, I've had veterans have had additional income like um, retirement or they actually have another job. We, and we put all that together as well to make sure that they have enough uh, assets and, and income to be able to afford this home. 
So um, it's a good product. Uh, it's a, the, one of the key things is it's 100% financing. Um, if you do have your VA buyers, um, this is something we normally do offer first before we go FHA or conventional. Any questions? You guys, hey. yes. Do you guys offer? Um, was it? It's called a. Um, what's it called? Overly with the text fat. You guys work with that. An overlay? I don't know. With the Us? Texas veterans. We do. We do offer uh, Texas land board. Okay. So it's pretty much just an extension of a a VA loan. It's 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 the same procedure. Only difference is that um, if uh, they're a Texas resident and they have been a Texas resident for the last three years, they they have the eligibility for Texas land board financing. It's uh, it provides better interest rates. However, it does have higher fees. So we usually do a, a comparison between, you know, one and another. Usually, the ones that can take um, the the best advantage of a Texas land board or a Texas vet is uh, veterans with disabilities, major Absolutely. disabilities. One hundred percent, they will get a markdown interest rate below market value. So they they could get like, for example, I think right now they're. Know, probably in the twos right now, two and a half maybe. So, so yeah, we do offer it. Appreciate it. Thanks. Mm -hmm. I have a question on the VA and the USDA. Do they have a debt to income um, ratio? That yes. Yeah, we do. We, we. I mean, they have to be under forty-five percent. Uh, I mean, that's, that's what the guideline has. We, we can run, the, again, the customers, everybody's going to be different. Sometimes they might be a little bit higher, but I, on the norm, uh, 45 is, your, is our cap for, for, for the ratios for both FHM and I'm sorry, for um, VA and uh, USDA. Just Thank to you. extend or elaborate a little bit more on that, um, when it comes to uh, debt to income ratios, USDA is a... Is, is still a government guaranteed note through the Department of uh, Agriculture. So it's flexible, but it's probably the most um, strict out of all uh, government agencies. So they'll require a 660 credit score and they will require debt to income ratios not to exceed 45%. And that's really a hard stop. Um, VA, on the contrary, it's probably the most flexible because it's trying to support uh, veteran financing as much as possible. So VA does not have a limitation on, 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 on ratios. Now take that and, and hold it to yourself. You don't want to give this to the, to the, to any, to any veteran or any buyer. Uh, but on very strong scenarios, financial scenarios, we can, we can go and on, you know, with ratios on, you know, 60, 65, I've done the highest I've done of ratio on a VA loan has been 73% uh, debt to income ratio. Uh, but it, it requires a very particular scenario. You know, this, this particular buyer had eight, 810 FICO scores had one thing that we have to be very careful with VA that is that's, uh, completely different than any other loan program is that VA requires a residual income to be met. So we do a separate calculation to see how much income do, does the veteran keep in his pocket and make sure that it meets the, the residual income requirement per VA guidelines. So, you know, but to give you an idea, you know, just so, so you know, uh, VA is very similar to FHA when it comes to debt to income ratios. You could, you could be, you know, mm -hmm. in the higher end and still uh, manage an approval with good FICOs. Um, with lower FICOs, you're certainly going to suffer with uh, ratios uh, required to be a little less. Thank you. Yep. Okay, so the, uh, the next slide is showing the, the products that we offer also is a down payment assistance program. Um, I only mentioned here T-Shack, we have another program as well that we have for down payment assistance, uh, but it's very similar to the T-Shack. Um, this program is, is geared for those individuals that are uh, lacking funds, similar to what FHA has, um, but we have uh, options for these type of buyers where they can come in with a lower down payment and this down payment assistance can cover some of that down payment or 
closing costs that is inquired on the transaction. So for these type of buyers, they have to have a 620 or higher FICO score. The program, when we set up the, the file, we try to see if they qualify for an assistance of three, four, or 5%. Okay, so um, the difference here is that when we run it, we wanna see if the buyer can, can uh, qualify for this down payment and TSHAC will assign the rate at that point. Uh, we don't have control about the rate that they will uh, get imposed on the buyer. Um, they're not, the rates are pretty good. It's just, it's just a matter of uh, when we're trying to run the scenario to see what the rates at that point would be. It does have to be um, owner occupied as well. Um, income and finance requirements. Basically, you must meet the criteria of the income, credit, and debt requirements to qualify to TSHAC down payment assistance. We have, uh, they've created a short uh, questionnaire that we have to go in there and test, answer some questions, and we can test if there's an eligibility concerns, and that will help us also determine if the income requirements are met by the buyer to see if they can be, um, they can use this program towards their benefit, okay? Um, TSHAC Home, Texas Home Heroes Program provides down payment assistance specifically for teachers, uh, police officers, firefighters, EMS and, uh, personnel, correction officers, and veterans. However, we do not have um, to fall into these categories. We, um, they're not profession, we have another program where they're not profession specific. So really anybody can try to get the down payment assistance program. Uh, before it was only for government entities. Now it's opened a little bit more broader to almost everybody to be able to see if they qualify for this assistance. First time home buyer status. Um, in some cases, you do not have to be the first time home buyer. Um, I've had this question before. Um, as anyone has not owned a home for the past three years, uh, that's the question that we need to answer. If they've not owned a home within the last three years, um, they are considered first-time home buyers. But if they have owned a home, they can still qualify, you know, under the under the guidelines for TSHAC. If it is a first-time home buyer, however, we can also qualify for special income tax credit programs. There's a, a program called a Mortgage Credit Certificate or MCC. This program, um, they have to um, get a certification when they're doing the loan process as well. And they can use this towards their credit on your taxes when they file their taxes. It just helps them give them a little bit more uh, return on, the, on their taxes when they're filed um, just because they've done this MCC or, or mortgage credit certificate has been assigned to them. Um, it, it is a, a, a very good program again, but we have to, you know, look at the customers case by case to see if the, if the uh, income eligibilities are there, then we can try to offer them uh, a down payment assistance program offer to, to your clients. Any questions? Eva, yes. so what are like, if, if we're in front of a, of a client, what are the things to look for if, if this person, let's say, says, well, yeah, but, you know, what, what, what are the qualifications that we have to look for in order to see, well, maybe you might qualify for the down payment assistance while we're talking to them? Yeah, so, the, so the, the one main thing is their credit score. They have to have a 620 or higher, right? Um, with us, with, the, with our company, we have, they've made a couple of adjustments on this program because when the COVID situation was happening, a lot of people were using this program. It, it is a grant from, from the state of Texas. So a lot of lenders were trying to make deals work and use the, the down payment assistance program. So it kind of um, saturated the market and the funds that were available for customers. So what they did do, they updated their requirements. So somebody with a, a 620, between 620 and 699 FICO score, the key is that their ratios, their DTI ratios cannot exceed 45%. So um, we have to look at that first before we say, yes, this program's for you, we can offer you the down payment assistance. If they have a FICO score of 700, then more than likely we're able to get them funds to assist them with the down payment and closing costs. But anybody between the 620 and 699 FICO score, um, 
we definitely need to check them out first to see if there's um, if they're eligible for these funds at this moment. Um, and if, so if I can add, yeah, go ahead. Ask. Just, I think as a real estate agent, what you want to maybe know more of is FICO score, which I've said 620. Are you over a 620 credit score? Um, are you know in the um, uh, the um, not necessarily you know, so. So the two eligibility requirements is going to be credit score and uh, income. Okay, so it, it, it's difficult. You know, there's a chart we can share that with you if you want to see it. Uh, is based on um, uh, household number of number of household mm -hmm. uh, people. So it, it could vary a little bit, but it, it normally is. I think it's capped at 82 or anywhere between 62, 65,000 to 82,000, depending on the household size. Uh, so anybody earning more than that, whether it's a first time buyer, whether they don't have any money at the end of the day, they won't qualify because there's income criteria uh, to, to be met. So, so you as a real estate agent, probably those are the two things, major things that you want to you know, inquire about and say, well, you know, if you don't have any money, if your credit score is over 620 and you know, you're not making over 65, $70,000, you may be eligible. Um, we still have to run an eligibility requirement, but they may be eligible for down payment assistance funds. Now, one thing that is very important, we, we do this explanation very thoroughly with the buyer because we don't want them to get, want them to get the impression that this is free money. There's a cost to everything. It, it sounds too good to be true just to get down payment and use it and rather than using your own funds, right? Well, the, the idea of the agencies is that they budget this into the state budget and they have allocated a big portion of funds, but they have to recuperate this somehow. So what they do is they mark up rates. So I, me as a lender, my responsibility is to show the buyer, if you use these, your funds for a down payment, this is the type of financing in terms that we can offer. Uh, then on an option B, down payment assistance, you're eligible. Instead of using your own funds, you could use the state funds for down payment anywhere between three, four, or even up to 5%, depending on the loan program. And by doing so, this is what the rate will look like because it's dictated by the agency. In this case, it could be TSHAC or there's TDHCA and SETH as well. So we would take that interest rate from the agency itself, from the, from the program itself, and they dictate that rate, which is higher than current market, and show them the difference on their monthly payment and how let's just say it's normally i don't know anywhere between your average is about 25 to 35 dollars even up to 50 dollars a month so that increment on your monthly payment how long will it take for you to absorb the down payment you're receiving and then from that point on how much are you going to end up paying back so it's something important that we always tell our clients look there's there's just simply it's, this is not free money there's a markup on the rate this is how much it will cost you if you keep this home 30 years, 20 years, 15 years, uh, versus you using your own funds and getting this type of term and comparing apples to apples. Thank you. Thank you, Oz. I um, did add a little bit more information in the back end, and it is very, um, like Oz says, we have to do some stuff on the back end when we're reviewing before we say, yes, this is uh, something that the customer can use. Um, I didn't put any of that information here just because it's, it's very, um, you know, we have to be uh, looking at every case to case base. Um, but definitely we can go in depth into the TSHAC um, in future trainings. If, if you need that information, we can provide it. So the home criteria, primary residence under TSHAC, they require you to live in the home that you're buying as a primary residence. That means that you cannot use this program to purchase a secondary home or a rental property. The sales price of the home as well, um, the home that you're gonna buy cannot exceed the, per the certain purchase price limits. The limits are set based on the percentage of the medium home price on the county, which means that the purchase prices are higher than in counties where homes are more expensive. So we have to look at the, at the information on their uh, website to see if it meets the income limits and the county limits for the sales price that they're trying to um, buy on this particular house that they're selecting. The home location, T-Shack down payment programs are statewide, so they offer it all over Texas. Um, so you can use our programs to buy a home anywhere in Texas, okay? Any other questions under the T-Shack or down payment assistance program that you might have? 
I like to add that this is an yes. excellent selling tool for you guys as real estate agents. Um, you know, use it as much as you want. You know, you're not false advertising. It is a true assistance. Uh, leave it. Leave the technicalities to yes. us on the yes. lending side. You guys maximize the potential of this. This is great, great marketing tools, marketing material that you could be sharing with all your sphere of influence. Uh, you know, and 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 just you know, more, ask more if you need to be more educated about it. We'll show you there's trainings for, for realtors as well that T-Shack does directly. So we've done a webinar just recently, mm -hmm. uh, but sometimes it could be a little tedious being on a group setting. Uh, there's their self-paced training as well. Uh, and there's the major two agencies that you want to look into is T-Shack, which is probably the, the most known out there, but there's also an alternative to TDHCA, which is a little bit more flexible even than T-Shack. Um, but like I said, if I was in your shoes, I'd be blasting this all over the place uh, because this captures attention. This is uh, geared specifically to your first time buyer market. So you, you, could, you could build your platform and your database with this program if you, if you utilize it correctly. And, it, and everything is set up. All you have to do is personalize it to you uh, the way you approach business and and believe me your your flow of leads will increase drastically if you utilize this correctly and and you know we can help you we'd like to be you know your your go-to people to you know to work with this program uh and and just ask us and we'll definitely you know ex ex exhaust our efforts to to try to get this uh out, on your hands so you can market and utilize it as much as, as you can most definitely. The actual website for T-Shack has advertisement material that we can go in there and personalize, like Oz says, with your information and you pass out those flyers out to your buyers. Uh, and it's very basic info. It's not complicated for them to understand. And we'll do the back end of, of um, seeing if they qualify or not for sure. One, one thing that I would even add is if you don't, so obviously sometimes by advertising down payment assistance, you you know, it's, it's, your consumer is not very well educated in our, in our market. So you're going to capture a lot of people that feel that because there's assistance um, that, you know, approval is different in our case than any other bank or any other lender. At the end of the day, it's still an FHA loan, it's still a conventional loan. It's still, we're just adding the assistance from the state. So you could lure more of a you know, just, uh, I guess, less quality lead type of, uh, you know, borrower. But T-Shack does have a homes, uh, a, a Texas Hero loan, meaning that it uh, targets uh, the teaching industry, the law enforcement industry, and even the, it's, it's the first responders, which is, you know, your, your, police, mm -hmm. your, um, uh, county jailer, your EMS. So you could make this, and these are usually very solid industries because you know, you're, you're especially your law enforcement, uh, PD, and uh, uh, most importantly PD, uh, you can gear this towards those industries and even personalize it, even though your, um, uh, what's it called, your uh, border patrol and customs, customs agents don't fall on the, on, under that category, you, you, you could personalize it and take it to these people. As long as they're first-time buyers, regardless of industry, they, they will qualify for this. The benefit of doing that, taking this to teachers, taking this to, you know, to, to PDs, and taking this to Border Patrol or first responders, is that majority of these individuals are professionals in their industry. Their salaries are very solid. Um, so a lot of them will qualify for the program and they're, they're well qualified because they're, they, they have decent income. So most of the time their income should be, um, should be solid and eligible for the financing as well. Uh, the only one that is a little difficult is your customs and border patrol. And I, you know, that's a reason why they don't gear it towards that industry is because they're high income earners. So they usually exceed the, um, the, the limit, but, uh, at the end of the day, you know, it's not necessarily that you're trying to be, uh, be um, misleading, but you want to capture their attention. You know, once let us know, let us let let you get the agent. I mean, the buyer. Let let us get the buyer, and then get, let them know if they're eligible or not. And at that point, you know, you could you could have earned uh, a a very solid lead. So. Again, you know, I can't stress enough how much value these programs can bring to you and your business. So utilize it to to its max. Um, one question. 
Is there a maximum amount of um, household, like the uh, how much a house can be worth for them to qualify under t -Shack? There is, yes, and uh, let me let me get that for you guys, and I'll I'll send it in the, in the chat. Let me see if I can capture it and, and send it in the chat in the chat group. Is that you, Laura? Questioning? Yeah. Yes, it's me. Okay. Yeah, it's a good question. Um, we have to go in there and, and check what the the location would be, but yeah, once we know, then then. Um, you're able to provide that to the buyer, right? So that you can know if, if it's even possible for them to qualify. Correct. Um, well, I was just looking for that. What's next after this? Um, we, we went over the products that we offer. One of the things I, would, I did wanna share with you is, is um, the way we operate with our company is, um, and one of the things that I really, really do like about uh, the way we, present ourselves as a lender to your buyer, we're, we're geared more to automation. Everything's done very um, user-friendly for your buyer. So for example, we have a call, you, you send us a lead, we call the customer and the customer says, yes, I'm interested, what do I do? Everything gets done via phone, we send them a link. Um, I did wanna talk over about the pre-qualification. I know sometimes we, um, we wanna, talk to the customer initially and start showing properties, but we try to um, educate agents, you know, to make sure that, that the first thing that we want these customers to have is a pre-approval. Um, the only way we truly know how much they can afford is trying to get these customers pre-approved. And that's where we come in and sending them these uh, uh, tools so that they can apply. And it could take us between, you know, within 24 hours, if somebody applies right now, we'll get them an answer this afternoon. Uh, at least we try to do that because that, that customer, once they're engaged, we don't want them to, to start looking elsewhere. Um, what to know, we, we do need to make sure that there's income there. Those are the questions that you're probably gonna ask those leads, uh, how stable their income is to ensure that the lender can make a monthly mortgage payment. We also make sure you know what their debts are, you know, we add up all their payments or car payments, credit cards, student loans. We even go further and make sure we, we uh, screen these buyers to make sure they don't have alimony or child support. Sometimes those questions are not asked at the beginning. And when we're already in the loan process, we find out that they did have child support, things like that. And, and it might not um, let us finish the transaction because of that reason. Uh, so we try to find ask those questions to your buyers when we're trying to uh, pre-approve them. We also check for total assets. Uh, we wanna make sure that they have money in the checking or savings account or other investments. Sometimes they, um, you know, they'll provide us with the bank statements and we'll know if, if there's any cash flow there or assets for them to be able to even conduct this, the transaction they're trying to make. Um, we do determine their monthly mortgage payments. Um, we also escrow third-party accounts. We'll include their, their taxes and homeowners insurance and any um, MI premiums in there. And all that, that payment will also be added to their current liabilities to make sure if they can even afford that home when we're doing the pre-approval. Um, some of the things that we, we also, when we're talking to a customer, these are the things we tell them. Once they're shopping around, we want them to look at at these items to make sure that they don't start moving their credit or doing things that will jeopardize the pre-qualification that they've received. So we tell them do not apply for new credit of any kind. Do keep all existing credit accounts open. Do not maximize or overcharge existing credit cards. Uh, we also tell them uh, to maintain their employment and current job. This is very important. Right now, a lot of people that are unemployed or losing their jobs or they're in furloughs. So if somebody's trying to apply, I always express to them, try to retain your job. Like don't switch your jobs right now during the time of your pre-qualification. Um, don't consolidate any debts to one or two cards. We also um, ask them to do pay off collections and judgments and tax liens reported in, in their uh, credit report. Um, 
We tell them not to pay any, make any large purchases. I've had customers go out, start shopping for furniture and appliances on credit and that can jeopardize their approval. Um, we want them to stay with their current existing accounts. Very important for them not to start closing accounts or consolidating their accounts because that, that, that could uh, hinder the approval as well. Um, we also tell them not, not to make any large item deposits. Uh, as was mentioning buyers with cash on hand or at home, um, when you're, and I'm sure most of you ask, where do you have your money? Do you, is it saved in an account or do you have it in cash? That could also be um, uh, important for us to know. And we also hey, tell them, Bande, yes. Sorry, quick question. Go for it. Um, uh, what would you consider a large deposit? What amounts? Um, that's a very good question, but technically it's about 1% of their um, monthly income. So yeah, it's very technical. Like we'll have to make the math for it, but large deposits, I mean, um, anything over $500, they're gonna question $500, $1,000. But really um, when we see them on the statements, we'll go back to their, their, their um, wages and we calculate to see, okay, well, it's under their, their uh, gross earnings a month. That's fine, we'll, they're not gonna question that large item deposit. It just depends. And we'll see a pattern if they're putting in, you know, five hundred dollars every two weeks. You, they're probably going to question it. Uh, and also to add on that, I mean, it. it um, we look for the for for the trend. Uh, if there's consistent cash deposits, there's no sourcing of it. They're very, you know, variable amounts. And it's a wage earner, someone that's on a salary, a teacher, or someone that works on an hourly basis, and you know, their check is also reflected. Well, it doesn't make sense. Where is this cash coming from? And the, we look for the accumulation of cash deposits within a 30-day period. So if those exceed the 1% of their gross income a month, then we're definitely going to question that. And it's very difficult to track or source you know, legitimate cash. I mean, at the end of the day, even if they have it on, on hand, and it's majority of the time is their own money. They just like to save it. Or you know, there's, there's just buyers that don't like banking, and they try to keep their money on hand. Uh, that becomes a challenge. So, the way we resolve it majority of the times is uh, if it's a true cash on hand, we, we ask them to deposit it before, we re before the cycle of, of the bank begins for the transaction. Then we'll wait it out until that completes. And once the statement becomes available, we'll get that without reflecting the deposit of, of, of the cash. Uh, but, you know, if you have... Um, a borrower that you're doing the loan for and the spouse or the non-purchasing spouse has, you know, a side business and you can somehow document that it's, uh, I don't know, they sell stuff online or they, whatever the case may be. And you have something that you could show that it's a trend, that it's small amounts, that is reasonable for what they're selling. It's more work. It's more leg work. We have to document and explain all of that. And, you know, customers tend to, you know, dislike that. And so do we, uh, but at the end of the day, we can, we can somehow document that as long as it's a, it's a reasonable explanation. Um, you know, we have people that, I don't know, work, uh, you know, cosmetology or the spouse is selling stuff online and, you know, we can show the track of those sales and, and it makes sense. Then, you know, we can always take that in consideration. But just, uh, I guess to, to, to answer your question is we try to avoid anything over a thousand bucks and it's uh and it's you know drastic it's out of an arm sticks out as a sore thumb that's what we want to avoid because it's really hard to document that worst case scenario Gavino, they'll back out that money and they have we have to source either payroll like they have to wait until the payroll accumulates for the money that they need something like that but they'll back out any large item deposits we can just use them for assets or um, for reserves. Yeah, that's that's a great uh, closing point to that. Um, yeah. I, I was going to say, I forgot to mention, it doesn't mean that it's going to jeopardize the closing of the transaction or the approval of the transaction, just simply that the cash amount has to be deducted from their current balance on their banking account. So that's the only complication of it. That's it. It doesn't be night alone. Any other questions? Um, I, I, going back, I, I think I, um, under uh, collections and judgments, um, the, the judgment is a question that I get asked all the time. If it does come out in the credit report, that judgment has to be paid off before the, the loan can close. 
So those are things that we spot at the very beginning and we uh, talk to the customer about it and we try to figure out um, if it's a durable payoff or not for them. But that's, that's one of the things that we look for is, is those, those judgments. Um, so on the application checklist, I did want to add this because I know sometimes when you're talking to a customer, they ask you, well, what do I need? What documents do I need to get pre-qualified? So this is just a very condensed version of what the items that we preliminarily looked at. Um, use this checklist to make sure that everything you need is, is there for the loan application. We might need additional documentation, but the basic bones of what we need is, is on here. Um, we look at two-year tax returns, 2018, 2019. Um, also, if they're a wage earners, W-2 earners, we'll need their two years W-2s for, for every employment they've had in the past two years. If they're self-employed, we will need their business tax returns if they file business taxes or personal taxes for two years as well. Um, and if possible, if they have their 1099s um, and copies of the registration of their business with the state of Texas, all that stuff, we, we, we would really appreciate looking at it in advance just because we want to make sure how they're established, if they're sole proprietors or their LLCs. Uh, we want to make sure that we're doing an upfront income analysis for them. We cover all angles before it's saying, yes, this customer is, is solid and we can go ahead and move forward with, with the purchase. Um, one of the questions we do ask on the self-employments too is have, if they haven't filed their 2019, have they done an extension? And if they have any tax debt, have they paid it in the past? Like their tax liability for the previous two years, because we're going to ask for a transcript from the IRS and we're going to know if they've paid their taxes or not. So we do ask those questions up front just to be sure that they've done their correct, um, filing as well. We do require two month bank statements. Again, uh, in some cases, we only need one bank statement. It's good to have two if we are provided two, just to see the trend of their deposits and how well they manage their account and if they have enough money there to be able to source their down payment and closing cost. Okay. The bank statements do have, all, have to be all pages. So when a customer is asking you, well, can I take a picture of the page one? No, no, no. I need all page one through six if the statement has six pages because that's what we have to submit to the lender. They want every single page and it has to be legible and it has to have the bank, um, the owner of the bank accounts information on there as well. Um, we've had cases where they like, for example, uh, I believe IBC, they can take a screenshot, but it, it doesn't, it blanks out all their info. So that won't help. We need to have the full completed bank statement. Explanations, and this is, this is where, uh, um, Davina was asking about the large item deposits. We're going to probably request uh, explanations if they have deposits over $1,000 on their normal pay into their accounts. We will take care of that. We do, um, we have the customer fill out an explanation form and we will uh, try to figure out where this money is coming from on their behalf. Um, we also do need 30 day pay stubs at least the most current ones. And throughout the process of the loan now, uh, we will be checking or asking the customer to provide us the most recent pay stub so that you can let your customers know, don't, don't get upset if they ask you for the next pay stub, even though you've already provided the current ones. Um, it's just part of the, of the situation with, with what we're going through right now. The, the investors wanna make sure that the customer's still employed, that they haven't lost their job or they haven't been laid off, or for a load, they want to double check and triple check that, that they're still making money, they're still working where they say they're working. Um, we do need valid driver's license and social security um, just to make sure that they're, you know, that they have their stuff in order. Um, they will be asked to sign explanation letters on inquiry reports. Specifically, they've been shopping around for different mortgage companies, or we see a lot of inquiries done recently. We want to know why are they inquiring so much? What, are the, what is it that they're shopping for? Is it a rate or they, are they applying for different types of credits other than a home purchase? Um, if they have um, REOs, existing real estate that they're going to retain, for example, they're going to buy a second home or um, you know, they're going to upgrade to a, a primary home, we will require mortgage statements from their current REO we will need to see their homeowner's insurance policy. 
and a recent tax statement because we have to allocate the expenses of the retained property on the new transaction that we're trying to do. We wanna make sure that they can still pay their taxes and insurance on, a, on those all those properties that they're retaining. If they are divorced, we're gonna need a divorce degree and separation uh, agreement. Um, that is a must uh, specifically for individuals that have child support or uh, for example, they got divorced, but they re their current mortgage is under credit, but it was deeded to the spouse. We need to make sure that that information was truly given to the spouse and they're no longer uh, responsible for that mortgage. And other than that, we'll require earnest money, copies of the earnest money check and purchase contract when they're ready to commence a transaction. Any questions? I mean, this is very, uh, there's more stuff that we require, but this is the basic stuff that we look for to give you a prequal. Not all of it applies to every buyer, but in some cases, when you do know that they need, the more information we get, the easier we'll say yes to the prequal and, and we'll have a solid response back with the agent. So uh, just to just to um, let you know, and some of you have already have this, and you already some of you already use this tool. We are truly automated. Um, clients can operate or download an application. Um, honestly, this has done a, it's a big 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 changer for me because now that we were in the, in at home working from home, we didn't stop operating because of this tool. So a customer would call and they wanted a pre-qualification. We send them the link and they applied in five minutes, truly five minutes, they fill out the application and we get the response like right there and then. And when we do, we we're able to generate a credit report, you know, get all that information that they've uploaded and we can make a decision in a matter of hours if the customer is willing to move forward with a pre-qualification. Um, one thing I did want to point out, if, if you want to um, have correlation and, and have some way of monitoring what the customer is doing, we do have a co-marketing option, and I've created some of you all's information, like Gabino's in there. So if you send me a lead and the customer says, um, you know, I, the agent was Gabino, I send them the link along with the agent's information and they know who is dealing with them on the agent site. So it's a really cool tool to use. Um, and um, it, it, just, it just puts everybody together in the same line uh, and keeping everybody informed who's doing what. Any questions on the application link? If, if you do have a customer, all we need is a phone number or an email and we can send them the link right there and then and they can, they can submit the application really, really fast. Any questions? I, I didn't talk a little bit about the one-time closing because I know we're, we're short on time, but as, um, that is a new part that we have a one-time closing for new construction. It's out there for us to uh, offer to your customers. Um, Oz, can you just give us a little bit of insight of that program that we, we've launched as well? Yes, for sure. So um, I, I guess, you know, for you guys as real estate agents, you know, the, the value of knowing that we do have this program available is when you have a buyer that has been looking and searching that property and all of a sudden, you know, starts, you know, looking and paying more attention for new build uh, instead of losing the client to a lot of these builders that will not care to pay any commission or, or have you involved in the transaction or if the buyer begins exploring the possibility of buying land or a lot for construction, um, this could be an option for you guys to remain in the transaction and, and still earn a profit or a commission on the transaction. Uh, you know, so it's, it's, a, it's basically a transaction in which allows the buyer to obtain financing for um, all the terms and all the, the phases of construction, which would be the lot, the construction in itself, and then the permanent financing for the 30, 20, 15 year term. Um, and it's only for FHA buyers and, uh, you know, the, the, the we do, we do a, a vetting process for the builder to make sure that there's no uh, judgments, liens, any, anything pending out there, any subcontractor liens. Um, so we, 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 we do, a, a, a thorough review as well on the builder itself. But again, you know, you as a builder, I mean, you as a real estate agent, you want to utilize this product as, you know, for those buyers that are now just kind of like maybe going cold on you because they don't find anything on the market and they're now looking at a builder, 
well, you know, just just let them know that that there's options for for you to still represent them with the builder, and we can we can definitely take care of their financing. A lot of builders will say, well, I you know I'll send you to my lender, and then there there goes your buyer, and there goes your transaction. So mm -hmm. this somewhat helps you retain the trust and and, and conversation with your buyer. And uh, you know we can also help uh, with that process as well by retaining the the product of uh, purchasing land, construction, and permanent financing in one one loan program. Any other questions? I'm gonna I'm gonna um, add the the PowerPoint to the chat so you can have the information from us there. Um, I added the T-Shack income and price uh, limit chart on the on the chat, so you guys should be. It's a PDF, so you guys should be able to open it and save it. Uh, I think actually the it's we're uh, we're in a non-targeted area, so our purchase price limit is two hundred ninety-four thousand and six hundred. And then as far as income goes, our limits are, again, on the, we're on the balance of state. So meaning that we don't have a specific area, but, you know, the remaining part of the state, which we fall under and any family size um, will be income limited, limited at 85,675. Uh, one to two uh, persons would be 74,500. And again, three or more people would be the 85,675. So those are the income limits. Anybody exceeding that on a combined income uh, won't be eligible for the program. There are situations in which the household income may exceed that amount, but if we can qualify the borrower with one of their income relative to both, is based on the income we're using for qualifying purposes. It's not what they actually report or earn as a total, is what we're using for qualifying purposes. A lot of times, you know, there's buyers that earn a lot of commission and we only need the base pay to qualify them. We go with base pay and as long as they're under that 74, that 85,000 mark, we can make them eligible for the program. Thank you, Oz. Any, any other questions you all might have? Um, we're, you know, we, we, on the website, we have the, uh, our phone numbers, Oz's phone numbers, my phone number. Um, Definitely, we're available for questions via text, via email, uh, so that you can ask us those questions when you have scenarios or customers that you're not quite sure about um, what we can offer them. Definitely feel free to call us or give us a text message and we can help you answer and, and maybe even put that customer into a pre-qualifying pre mode so that you can start doing uh, you know, your side of, of showing them homes as well. So I I don't know anything else you want us to add, Mac. I appreciate oh, that was, the time that was, and that was really good. I appreciate that. Appreciate that. Yeah. Yeah, certainly. And I I think it's it's of great value for you guys and and not I wish every agent would take the opportunity and the advantage of, you know, sitting with a lender and talking uh, you know, just detailed information about financing. Uh I can guarantee you some of the information you're taking from this small session some very seasoned agents are not even aware of. So, um, you know, kudos to you guys and try to take advantage. You know, every time you guys have an opportunity to, you know, whether it's us or anybody else and just pick their brain, uh, you know, just that's what we're here for. Uh, we really want to, you know, create a strong relationship with you guys where you guys have that trust and any questions, any, anything that we can do to help you. And uh, most importantly, bring value to you as a real estate agent and to your consumer base. Uh, by all means, you know, utilize us to, to your advantage. That's what we're here for. Cool. Appreciate it. Unless you guys have anything else, we'll call that a day. That was awesome. Emma, well, yes, Emma, sir. Did you say you were going to post this uh, presentation on the chat? I sent, I put the, um, the presentation on there already. Uh, if you can't see it, Raymond, I'll send it to you individually. I, I'm not seeing yeah. it either. Okay. Uh, I would like you know to get it, it went it went private it went private. Let me try doing it again. Hold on. Yeah, I do that all the time. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let me see. It's teaching it's teaching uh, the I think it was the ABR course last week. And I uploaded a couple forms. I said I've uploaded them. I look at the chat and it's like, oh shoot, I uploaded them to one person. <laughs> <laughs> so 
So I don't know where to do it. <laughs> on the chat, does it show a file there? So you can either upload it as a file or you can just copy the link depending on where you have it at. Okay. Let me do it again. Might have, you might have disabled the chat. Probably. <laughs> there. Can you see it now? Mm -hmm. It says I have um have a private it says something privately, so uh, I'll send it to Mac and I'll have Mac can you forward it to them as well? Sure. And I'll just okay. Yeah. That way. Change the Oops. chat to uh from private to uh everyone. Yeah, that's because it's not it's not showing me. Okay, I'm gonna try one more time. Change it to everyone and you'll you'll send it to everybody. It's still sending it to Laura because Laura was texting me. <laughs> can you see it now? No, I don't think you can see no, it. No, only I see it. But yeah. you can just change from where, where you put Laura, then just change that the chat to everyone. Ah, oh, there you go. Now I'm going to send it to you. Sorry. <laughs> okay. There. There you go. Yeah, there, there, you, there go. you go. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you so much, guys. And, and any questions, again, we're here. We're here to help you guys out and uh, use us as much as you can. We work weekends. I know some of you all uh, text me. I know Gavino is really good in, in asking me questions on Saturdays and Sundays. Uh, I, I mean, I'm available. I know uh, maybe Oz might, might um, have a different schedule, but um, don't hesitate. I mean, that's what we're here for. If we can help you answer questions and get some customer the information out that day. I send out pre-calls on Saturdays and Sundays. It's very, very easy now with this automation that we have. Take advantage of it. Uh, believe me, it's we're here to give you those tools so you can also be successful on your end. Okay. Appreciate your time. Thank you guys, appreciate Thanks. you. Thanks, appreciate it. Yes, thank you, Mac. Let's have a good one. Thank you, bye. <laughs>